awards over the years, including Legislator of the Year from the National Association of Social Workers. Oh, you don't have to go through all that. <laughs> Woman of the Year from the Waterville Women's Club. Today, Marilyn is here to speak about children who were put up for adoption and brought to Waterville, I believe, by Catholic priests in Boston. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to bring to you former representative Marilyn Kennedy. Definitely. 
Well, whether the boy sitting across from you in biology class will ask you for a date. Very definitely. <laughs> As for the rest, whatever your parents tell you about the world around you, all of it becomes the irrefutable <clears throat> truth. You just don't challenge it, and it becomes the norm that everybody else lives by. So I never for a minute, for a minute entertained the thought that my mother's background might have been unique. But then, when you start to grow, and you become a little more curious about the world outside your little realm, um, you do become a little more curious. And when I was about 25 years old, sitting at a counter in a local sandwich shop, I struck up a conversation with an elderly man who said to me, I think I know your mom. She was one of those kids who were brought up from Boston, lined up in St. Francis Church here in Waterville, and picked up a line by the Hale family. Well, that got my attention. <laughs> but later on, when I thought about it, it sounded like a kind of an unlikely tale. And as a busy young mother of two children, by then I had other things to do than concern myself with gossip or hearsay. But I just tucked that remark into my memory bank. So later in life, when my children were grown and established, I became a little more curious about my heritage. So I decided to do a little research. About, you know, my mother being kicked out of the line was after all it's kind of a weird story. By then my mother had passed, but her brother Henry was still very much alive and well, living in one. So I decided to start my research there because his wife was a stickler for keeping records of everything from the dates of family weddings, subsequent births, and how many months, of course. <laughs> yeah, his illnesses, obituaries, all that stuff. And when I visited her home, she pulled out a stack of papers, rifled through them, and pulled out the records she had kept for many years about Henry and my mother. It was all pretty sketchy, but she didn't know about the home. My grandmother's maiden name, which was Nellie Whalen. When she immigrated from Ireland to America, my grandfather's name, Thomas Oates, and when my uncle Henry and my mother were brought from the home in Boston to Maine. So with this information, I called officials of the local church, who you think would know something. But they had no, absolutely no record of any such event. So next I called the office of the diocese in Portland, and no luck there either, which I found pretty surprising again. It seemed to me that if anybody should know about the connection between the home and church authorities in Maine, it should be the bishop's office. They don't always keep very good records, you know. They have no record detailing any such transfers, and I began to why it was so difficult to find information about a life-changing event, such as my mother was reported to have been. The secretary of the diocese did tell me about that the home still existed in Boston, and that its mission and name had been changed to keep up with the times. So they suggested I contact Sister O'Leary at a place called Nazareth, Inc. When I called Nazareth, Sister O'Leary informed me in kind of a, well, I gotta say, snotty voice, that in order for her to send the records I wanted, I had to put all of the specifics in writing. So I did. And what I received in turn was somewhat of a bombshell, which I'll get to later. Along with the personal information she sent was a summary of the history of the home. So let me read you an excerpt from the history that explains the way in which children were brought to the home and the kind of care they got. Quote, children are received without charge and sheltered, clothed, fed, and instructed until they are either restored to their relatives or placed in good Catholic homes. It's not left to them to apply for admission or to their guardians to place them in the home. An active search for them is constantly maintained in the city by several persons. The superintendent watches the municipal court and prison for their appearance near the place. The directors of the home keep up a perpetual surveillance of their respective parishes 
for the same purpose. So when God is watching out there, the members of St. Vincent de Paul Society pursue them in their homes and notify the officers of the institution where they may be found and the truant officers and the agents of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children aid and abet as far as they are able. So the history goes on to say that the, in the report for the year ending 1894 shows that 820 children were received at the home, 788 were placed in families. So it looks like a very small percentage of children were returned to their families. The history of St. Mary's Infant Asylum, Georgia, the Vettus for Children Under Three, includes the following summary. In the past year, 475 children were seen. The mortality rate was 30%. They call that a low figure. Let us remember that a large number of children were brought to the home in a sickly or dying condition. And regardless of how authorities justify that, I found that 30% figure unsettling. Even more disturbing was the idea that church authorities could take such extreme measures as to pursue families into their own home to decide the fitness of parents to take care of their own children. One could argue that in today's world, state authorities are sometimes too lenient in deciding whether a parent is fit to care for their children. But I don't think anyone would disagree that separating children from their parents is a step that requires more consideration than was done by church authorities in those days. And I should mention here that Henry and my mother had a brother, William, who was a year younger than Henry. Henry was about six then, and my mother was two, and uh, little Willie was five. So now, now let me read you verbatim the explanation for why my mother, Henry, and William were placed in the home. Apparently, church authorities paid a visit to the old home, because this is what the record says. Quote, parents intemperate, mother deserted, sent by Reverend Frawley and brought to their home, to the home by their aunt, Miss Lizzie Otis, to be kept for one moment. Apparently, after the month elapsed, the children were released from the home, but then brought back to the home again. The explanation given this time, I don't know if this is the same explanation because the sister that sent me this said that the record was so faded she had a hard time reading it. Quote, parents very intemperate and shiftless, brought by an officer in a patrol wagon. Both parents arrested and taken to state, station house. Children were naked and hungry. In November 1903, the children were taken to court in the case to be tried that same month and year. On August 1903, all three children were placed in the home. But my mother went to Mary's infant asylum where children under the age of three were sent. The record goes on to say that in 1904, little William died in Boston City Hospital of diphtheria. It's all tragedy, all of it, you know. And then on April 1904, Henry was brought to Maine and placed with Victor Roy of Green Street in Waterville. And apparently that placement didn't work out, as he was later transferred by Father Shalom, pastor of St. Francis, to the job of them, that's J-O-B-B-E-R, not Java, where he grew up and apparently thrived. As for my mother, she was brought to Maine and taken in by Adelaide and Amanda Hale, both of Canadian origin who had settled here in Waterville. I did one final bit of research on the case because I wanted to get a copy of the records that show what the court had decided in the case of the old children. So I headed to Boston with a friend. We waited outside the records office while the clerk searched records that were more than 100 years old. Probate court documents revealed that the Home for Destitute Children sought and received formal guardianship of the children on September 7, 1905, one year after Henry was placed with Victor Roy in Waterloo. So it was one more shopper and then among the many I experienced delving into my mother's heritage. What's missing from the records I received from the home is how the Hales and Jarvis knew 
the children were available to adopt, and how church authorities knew the Hales and Jarvis wanted to take them in. There was just no mention of children being brought up on a tray, lined up at church, and parishioners picking children out of the line. The history of home does include the following information. In the latter part of the 19th century, the number of needy children was greater than the number of Catholic family homes in the area who were able to take these children in and care for them. So hundreds of children were sent on orphan trains to the farmlands in western United States. Once they arrived at their destination, the priests would take them to the farms and place them in foster homes. As with any system, some of these placements didn't work out. And the children were sometimes viewed as sheep labor and improperly treated. So if the situation was unbearable, the children would either run away or find their way back to the home. So in 1900, farmers began replacing child labor with machinery and the frontier closed. Two factors that contributed to the discontinuous, the discontinuous of the Catholic version of orphan trains. But the history goes on to say that in place of trains, the children were sent on orphan trolleys, I don't know what that means, to lo local parishes where they would attend Sunday service and meet the parishioners. The parishioners would then choose a child who would live with them, and in some cases the children found a permanent placement in these homes. Now when I campaigned for public office, I visited Paul Mitchell's home several times. Paul was George's brother, and even though my purpose in visiting him was political, he never wanted to talk about politics. He was more interested in discussing Austria interest in the so-called orphan trains of war. Mainly because he said his father was one of the children brought to Maine from the home. This was confirmed by his brother, the esteemed George Mitchell. In 2006, speaking at an American Ireland Fund luncheon in Philadelphia, where he was guest of honor, Mitchell spoke movingly about his father, George John, whose father came from Ireland. Mitchell said that soon after they emigrated, his father, then a young child was placed in an orphanage. And in the fashion of the day, Mitchell recounted, the orphan kids were brought to the local church in Maine, lined up at the altar rail, where parishioners would literally walk them home and adopt them then and there. It's not clear what happened to young George's parents, but George Mitchell's father came to bear the Mitchell name because an elderly couple had picked him out of the line and gave him a good home. Am I telling the truth here? Yeah. <laughs> Mitchell was from Oz, with yet another piece of corroborating evidence of the story I had heard so many years ago about my mother being picked out of a line in St. Francis Church. And on another occasion when I was camping, I visited the home of Mary and Clayton Laverdia. They are both gone now, but Mary told me that her mother too had come to me via the church's version of an orphan and what I find surprising is that there's no record of these events anywhere in church records or in the archives of the local newspaper. You think? There would be. Often train programs sometimes resulted in siblings being taken in by separate families and thus permanently separated. That wasn't the case with my mother and her brother Henry. And I'd like to get a picture of both of them right now.
The story describing how and why my mother and her brother were brought from the home to Maine doesn't end there. For many years after coming to Waterloo, neither Henry nor my mother knew anything about the family they had been taken from in Boston. But according to my Aunt Georgie, Henry had a friend who lived in Boston and who, after conducting a bit of research, was able to locate their birth mother. By then, she was remarried to a John Tracy and doing quite well financially and otherwise. Henry and my mother called her and then took the train to Boston for a very emotional meeting between my grandmother, Helen Whalen Tracy, and her long lost children. And I remember my aunt saying that when they met, my grandmother was so overwrought she could hardly speak. According to probate records, the home was required to publish a notice in a local newspaper saying that the home was seeking guardianship of the children. And subsequent records stated that, quote, the next of kin and all other persons interested in said minors have had due notice, unquote. But my grandmother had a different version of what took place. She said she simply didn't have the financial means to support the children but that she visited them in the home nearly every day, until finally the sister in charge told her not to visit so often as the children carried on so after she left. She went on to say that one day she went to visit the children at the home and found them gone, and that the administrators of the home refused to tell them where they were, and that for many years she had tried to find them. As for my grandmother, he said, my grandfather seems to have dropped off the face of the earth, but many years after my mother died, I learned that he died at the age of 39. You know, I never met my grandmother with no interstate highway. I gotta look over to see Betty here. Boston was a long way from Waterloo in those days. She died in 1942 at the age of 67. My mother was a stiff upper lip no kind of nonsense, mother. I don't remember her ever crying, except once, the day she got word from Boston that her mom had died. She was barely three when the hells picked her out of a line. Look at that picture. Yeah. Who's that?
public policy was finally implemented. So let me quote from a statement made by a direct a director of Nazareth, the name given to the home and its mission changed many years later. Foster, quote, foster or adoptive placement of children is made only after every available resource to hold the family together has been exhausted. So you see how they change over time. In the majority of cases, the Nazareth staff works in partnership with the parents and family members to work through problems and stabilize the family so that the child can return to his or her biological family. Well, that's, that's the good news. Yeah. I think it's great. But here's the bad news. A couple of days ago, an editorial appeared in the Waterville Sentinel called Miami. The writer quoted statistics showing that foster children are often left to fend for themselves when they age out of foster care. And they consequently only half complete high school and many become homeless. That's a far cry from the care my Uncle Henry and my mother received. They were indeed a success story thanks to the kindness of two Franco-American Maine families. So in closing, let me say that I think my mother's story speaks to another historical fact. Separation of children from their families is far from new. Aborigine children in Australia were removed from their families by authorities who thought them dirty, shiftless, and unfit. So they thought the children would be better off with white families. Those separation programs lasted until 1970. Enslaved parents were separated from their children to slave auctions. And here in Maine, Native American children were forcibly separated from their families and sent to live with white families stripped of their culture and required to assimilate. I don't know if you all know that, but actually it's a fact. And let's face it, separating families is still happening today.